The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is 40 years old this year. How has this document changed our country? How has it changed Canada? Well, joining me today is one of the original signers of the Charter, the Honourable Brian Peckford. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. So as we've been talking about all over the news, everybody celebrating the Charter, looking back at the past 40 years, looking back at the history of the signing of the Charter, we thought, what better way to talk about that momentous occasion in Canadian history than inviting the only living signer of that document to join the podcast to walk us through what happened, tell us the story, and uh, help us understand why this document was so needed. So joining me today is the Honorable Brian Peckford. Mr. Peckford served as the Progressive Conservative Premier of Newfoundland, Labrador from 1979 to 1989. He's the last living signatory of the Charter. Also as Premier, his government established the Atlantic Accord, which brought offshore oil and gas revenues to the province that ultimately shifted the province's fortunes, economic fortunes, from being a perpetual have-not province, which takes money from the federal government to it shifted that, transformed it into a strong performing province that is a have province, which means that they contribute more than they take out. Mr. Peckford is the author of the book, Someday the Sun Will Shine and Have Not Will Become No More, beautifully titled memoir about his time as premier and the triumph to have control over the province's natural resources. Bryant currently serves as the chair of both the board of directors and the advisory board of Taking Back Your Freedoms, an organization formed last year to equip and mobilize citizens towards taking back their constitutional and God-given freedoms. Over the past year, Mr. Peckford has become a symbol of Canada's opposition to government overreach in response to COVID-19. Mr. Peckford is a very popular speaker. He has spoken to thousands of people at freedom rallies in his home province, his now home province of British Columbia, and was a supporter of the Freedom Convoy protests in Ottawa. Peckford is also suing the federal government, and hopefully we will talk to him a little bit about this. This is over the federal government's vaccine mandate with regards to air travel, and he's working with our friends over at the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms on that. So all that is to just say, Brian, it's a tremendous honor to have you on the program, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, too. I think it's <clears throat> important for us all to uh, speak up whenever we can as it relates to the freedoms that the Canadians are supposed to enjoy. Well, that's that's the theme of the of the show. So many of the sort of stories that I've seen talking about the charter and looking back at, at the, its forty year history and what happened forty years ago. Unfortunately, they don't take a critical enough uh, look at the ways that our, our freedoms have been, in some ways, many ways, eroded and and uh, neglected over the past few years. So hopefully, we can get into that conversation today. Uh, first off the bat, though, I just want to ask you. So take us back forty years ago to the the signing of the constitution. What, what was the process? I know it was a long, I think, 17-month ordeal, negotiating many, many things, not just the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So uh, take, take us back 40 years. Why, why did Canada need a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and why did this constitutional negotiation uh, begin and get underway? Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Canada was formed as a country in 1867 with the BNA Act, the British North America Act, which defined Canada and the nature of our government. In other words, that it would be a federal government, not a unitary government. That means that powers would be shared between the federal government and the provinces. There were only four provinces at the time that formed Canada, Upper and Lower Canada, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So Canada started with four provinces, not 10 provinces that it has today. And we grew into 10 provinces over time. Uh, missing from that document which formed Canada was anything to do with individual rights and freedoms. They were not described in the BNA Act, which created Canada. Uh, we relied upon, because we came out of the British system, the British common law, the unwritten British common law. And so from 1867 until really 1960, that's how Canadians defended their individual rights and freedoms. There was nothing written in the constitution. If you look to the south of us, in the United States of America, their country was formed in 1776, and they had a written Charter of Rights and Freedoms, or Bill of Rights, <coughs> in 1791, only 15 years after they became a country. In our case, we formed our country in 1867 and didn't get a written charter until 
1982, actually formalized in 1982. So there was through the uh, part, early part of the 20th century after we became a country, uh, various moves underfoot to indicate that why don't we have a written charter of rights and freedoms like the Americans? Why do we depend upon unwritten uh, uh, British common law and uh, the precedents that have been set over the years in the courts? And uh, that debate, uh, you know, ro ro rose and fall over time. But up into the 1960s, uh, it became more pronounced in saying that something should be written as related to our individual rights and freedoms. And that's when John Diefenbaker, who was the prime minister in 1960, introduced what we know as the Bill of Rights. And But there was two failings with that Bill of Rights. One was that it was just a federal act and therefore only applied to federal jurisdiction and not to provincial jurisdiction. So therefore it never covered all Canadians, but only covered some Canadians. And after that 1960 Bill of Rights, there was a movement underfoot stronger than ever to try to put something in writing in a constitution, not just a federal act or a provincial act. So it would cover everybody in the country and uh, put it in writing and have something firm, uh, identifiable and easily to reference. And so uh, through the six, from the 60s on, there were the various talks, but it always got stymied and delayed and uh, canceled by a debate over a, an amending formula. In other words, if we amended the constitution and brought in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and became totally independent and not having to go back to England for any more amendments, how would we amend our own constitution into the future? And there was great debate over that and, and nothing could be decided. But by 1980, there was a strong, strong movement from the 1960s to do that. And so uh, in 1980, the first ministers of Canada, uh, all the premiers and the prime minister agreed to get together to see whether we could do two things really, patriate the constitution and also add a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, once we patriated it, as well as a number of other items. And so we began to uh, negotiate in 1980, and uh, that culminated in uh, 1981 with an agreement called the Patriation Agreement, which became the Constitution Act of 1982. It was a long, tortuous negotiation of 17 months because it was interrupted by the Prime Minister of Canada at the time, who was Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who found that he, he, he discovered or he thought that provinces were being too difficult. And so he left the table and tried to patriate the constitution and bring in a charter of rights and freedoms and other changes on his own. And so he passed the law in the House of Commons to do just that and passed by the Senate and became a law of Canada that the government of Canada would go ahead unilaterally bring the constitution home from England for good uh, and attach a charter of rights and freedoms to it, as well as other changes. Well, the provinces objected to this because we're a federal state and not a unitary state. And so eight provinces opposed what he was doing. Two provinces stayed with the federal government. And so we took him to court over this action. And we won uh, that action in the Supreme Court of Canada in September, 1981. And the Supreme Court said that the Prime Minister of Canada and the government of Canada could not unilaterally patriate the Constitution and attach a Charter of Rights to it on their own. They couldn't do it unilaterally. They could only do it through the provinces and with the provinces. And so uh, the Prime Minister lost and he was forced then to come back to the table that he had left if in fact we were going to get a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, if we're going to get patriation. If we're, if we're going to get other things. And we succeeded after three days of final negotiations on November 3rd, 4th and 5th, as a result of a proposal that I, on behalf of Newfoundland, put forward to the rest of the provinces. It was this proposal that was accepted on November the 5th by all the first ministers except Quebec. And uh, the Supreme Court of Canada decision did not say that you had to have unanimity in order to get a change. It said you had to have a lot of the provinces on side. And of course, we had nine out of 10. And so therefore, that met the constitutional test 
of the Supreme Court of Canada. And therefore, we got the Patriation Agreement of 1981, which contained, among other things, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which became the Constitution Act of 1982, which means that this year is the 40th, 40th anniversary of the Charter and the other changes becoming law. What is not understood by most Canadians is because now under the pandemic situation which has occurred and the violations of the Charter is that uh, people forget that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms came into being as a result of a package. Not just the Charter of Rights was negotiated. It was the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, patriation, bringing the Constitution home, uh, Indigenous rights, Native First Nations rights in Section 35, an amending formula, regional economic uh, expansion uh, and equalization, and minority language rights. So when people say to me, well, why didn't you put this in the charter, or put that in the charter, or take that out, they don't seem to understand we just weren't negotiating a charter. The charter was part of a bargaining chip with other things that I just outlined in it. But we did get freedoms for individuals, and we did get rights for individuals in sections two, six, seven, and 15 of the charter, which now are being highlighted because the governments of this nation through the pandemic measures have seen fit to violate those sacred rights that were in that charter of rights and freedoms. Okay, well, thank you so much for that background and that, and that history. It's really helpful to sort of put it all together. I have an interesting anecdote because I went to study in Australia and one of the first things that we were told during the sort of orientation was, you know, unlike in the US, unlike in Canada, we don't have a Bill of Rights. Um, so, so you don't have the same, uh, you know, amendments to the Constitution that you have in the United States, you don't have the same um, Charter of Rights and Freedoms as you do in Canada, and that might mean that you could you know, get yourself into trouble. That, that was sort of the context of the discussion we were having. Uh, but I remember talking to a friend of mine who was in law school, and her perspective was, that you don't need to have your rights codified. That that in fact, when you write your when you when you codify your rights and have them listed, not only does it list what your rights are, but it limits what's not there. And so I'm I'm wondering if you can sort of comment on whether you think Canada is better off having a codified list of what our rights are, like a piece of paper that you can uphold and you can take to court and you can use to justify, or whether the ancient sort of you know, common law tradition that Australia still uses that the British use um, is, is, is a better approach. What, what do you think? I think Australia has since your time now have some um, Bill of Rights in their, in their constitution. Uh, I just noted that the other day, a decision out of uh, Australia referred to it. And by the way, the wording is very much similar to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But to come to your main point of British common law and why a codified um, charter is better than a uncodified list of rights. That's the problem you have with uh, unwritten um, rights and freedoms is that they are unwritten and therefore the interpretation can vary over time with various precedents set by various judges. If you have something which is in writing and it is a sentence, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, if you want, or freedom of religion or freedom of conscience, that's it. it. And it's quite clear. If in fact you rely upon uncodified rights and freedoms, then you're subject to the whims of a judiciary over centuries, where one judge or one lawyer could bring up, well, in this case, it said yes. In this other case, I'm not so sure who said yes. And so therefore, <clears throat> this can get evolve over time and change over time. When <clears throat> many people believe that we need, need to have fixed um, uh, charter rights or bill of rights or uh, fixed freedom rights in a constitution so that it's not up to the whims of anybody, whether it be parliament or judges to change uh, according to their own biases at the time in their own history at the time. That's one of the, the problems you have. It is a riskier proposition to maintain a given right, given that it can change over time with various individuals, various judges. So I think that's one of the uh, most important factors, which most of us at the time in 1980, 81 and 82 considered that it was necessary to have something that individual citizens could look to. 
as saying, we do have something that we can refer to immediately and understand. It's not just for the lawyers and for the judges, it's for individual citizens to understand that they have certain constitutional rights guaranteed in law, in the constitution, written down, and is not subject to the whims of uh, history or individuals over time. Interesting. That's a great point. Uh, I had Dr. Uh, so I had Mr. John Carpe on the program a couple of days ago talking about the charter. He he runs the Justice Center, which I know you've done some work with. And one of the sort of limits he 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 said when he was talking about the charter, why it doesn't always uh, uphold our rights and freedoms the way that we want, is he, he talked about ch- uh, Section One of the charter, which says that the charter rights can be limited by law so long as those limits can be shown to be reasonable in a free and democratic society. So that 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 verbiage, that line. The beginning sort of pretexts the Constitution saying if, if, if a government can prove that it's reasonable um, in a free and democratic society, that's justification and, and that can convince a, a court and a judge. Uh, go, go ahead if you, if you want to respond to that. Well, I think you left out the most important part of Section 1, and that is in, in a, I'm, a, I'm a, a, an old English teacher. And if you read Section 1 and they read it out, the verb in that sentence is demonstrably justified within reasonable limits by law in a free and democratic society. And a lot of lawyers since this came into being have tried to twist that meaning and always just talk about reasonable limits. Hold on, hold on. Uh, In that sentence, there is demonstrably justified. Now I make two arguments as it relates to section one. Unfortunately, I'm the only first minister still alive who was there when this was written. The intent of section one was to apply if the state was in peril, war, insurrection, or some other extreme event which threatened the existence of the state. That does not exist today, does not exist during the pandemic circumstance of the last two years. And therefore section one, in my view, does not even apply in this circumstance. And intent is very important in jurisprudence. Uh, The courts very often look behind the piece of legislation or the piece of law from the constitution and look behind it to say what was the intent of the founders what was the intent of the creators of that section well i can tell the judge and i can tell the lawyers and i can tell canada that as one of the people who was there that was the intent of section one it was to be used only that's why we went in the constitution it's the constitution is more permanent than a piece of federal legislation or a piece of provincial legislation. It was put there to be permanent and only to be changed in the most extreme circumstances. We're not into that extreme circumstance. However, I go on to argue in order to give, um, what shall I say, courtesy more than anything else. And to be fair, uh, I say to people, okay, for argument's sake, let's say that section one does apply in this pandemic circumstance and therefore the Good, the governments could go ahead and use section one. There are four tests in section one, even if it does apply. And the most important test, contrary to what a lot of the lawyers and others have been saying over the last two years, is the test of demonstrably justify. That's the verb in that sentence. That's the predominant operative phrase in that larger sentence, demonstrably justify within reasonable limits by law in a free and democratic society. Well, no government, 14 governments of Canada, 10 provinces, federal government, or the three territories have demonstrably justified what they are doing under their mandates. They have not met the test of demonstrably justified. Everybody in Canada who knows anything about public policy knows that when you use the words demonstrably justified, and I remember when we put demonstrably in there to make it stronger, not just justify. Most public policymakers know that means cost benefit analysis or some other approach. How do you demonstrably justify what you're doing? You are government, that is. Well, you find, try to find out whether what you're doing has more benefits than costs. And as we now know and have known for a long time, uh, only about 90 or 100 days into this pandemic, that the cure was worse than the disease that all these pandemic measures that were brought in where people died because they never got to see a doctor, delayed surgeries, uh, suicide, you know, many families broken up and the like, 
Dr. Douglas Allen of Simon Fraser University did a study in which he reviewed 80 other studies from around the world as to whether there were the cost was, you know, was whether the, the benefit was greater than the cost on these uh, measures. And he found out of 80 studies that no, it wasn't justified what they were doing. And this was published in April 2021, that study out of our own university in Canada by Douglas, Douglas Allen. You very seldom hear tell of the report. I wonder why. It's because his definitive report, now nobody's ever uh, questioned the validity of the report. Nobody's ever questioned his methodology. It's, the report is there out public for anybody to read. And that's what it concluded. And he also said in that document that 90 to 100 days after the pandemic was declared in like March 2020, it was clear to policymakers and others that we have real problems here by implementing these mandates. It's very, very negative. And so uh, the test of section one has not been met, even if section one does apply. And if you want to take it further, another test there was free and democratic society. Well, a free and democratic society means that therefore parliamentary democracy. That's what Canada means when you say free and democratic society. We have parliaments all over Canada. We have 14 of them. And therefore, the parliaments should have been called and kept open. Not called just to give the government more power, but called and stayed open and a parliamentary committee of that parliament established to review what the government was doing to see whether in fact it was beneficial. And then they would have called in other people to the committee other than just the government scientists to get a broader view of this situation to see whether in fact it was a valid thing to do at that time. They didn't do that. So my argument is that number one, section one does not apply because it doesn't meet the intent. And I was there and I know what the intent was. And that's why it was put in the Constitution. And by the way, if you go down to Section 4 in the Charter, which it talks about extending the life of a parliament if, we're, if we have to. Uh, under what conditions could you extend the parliament? War, insurrection, if the state was in peril. So that was what was on our minds. It was clear in Section 4 what was on our minds. It was a very extreme event for Section 1 to be triggered. And that extreme event does not exist today. But I go on to say, as I said in summary, that even if Section 1 does apply, the governments of this nation did not meet the two very important tests of the four, one, demonstrably justify, or within the context of a free and democratic society. Well, thank you for making that important uh, clarification. I must have just been uh, misreading the uh, section one there, but I think I think you, you really uh, robustly answered that question. Uh, but it does beg the next question, which is, why the why it, you know if, if the section one test wasn't met how is it that the governments were able to steamroll so many of the other rights that were written down in the charter how, how did this play how did it play out why did it play out how was it able to be the case in canada yeah, you know it as well as i do they just went ahead and did it and nobody uh, uh, well what really happened i guess is that um, early on the uh, imperial college of london uh, in england uh, issued a report which the White House in the, the United States, uh, uh, with the Parliament in, in Canada and all the world, brought into this fear mongering that the Imperial College of London said, where millions were going to die, some die in the streets. They even talked about deaths in the streets of, uh, of China at the time in Wuha because of this uh, virus and so on. So a climate of fear was created very early on into this pandemic. <clears throat> which just about everybody bought into, except myself and a few others, but a lot of people bought into this. And this gave the government's license, they thought, to go ahead and violate uh, the freedoms and rights enshrined in the Constitution of Canada. And uh, unfortunately, so <clears throat> that's what happened really, is that a mass psychosis overtook the, the society and people, uh, were very subservient once fear set in to going along with the government narrative. So I, it, it goes to show, as we know from history, that uh, very often leaders uh, reach their own um, limits, the, the normal limits that apply to a government or apply to a leader. And this is what happened in this sense, 
and I've been fighting ever since to get this back. To uh, to get the, now, uh, we we must say that the the fight is not over. And this is the other thing that people say: well, the charter has been thrown out the window, and that's the end of it. Well, if that was so, then the uh, courts of appeal of the provinces have not heard yet, nor has the Supreme Court of Canada. It's the lower courts that have heard the cases so far and have ruled against us and ruled for the governments. But the, the other point I, I must make is that the first words of the Constitution, of the Charter, are not Section 1, are not in Section 1. The first words of the Charter, which therefore comes before Section 1, and under which Section 1 is to be considered, are this country was founded on the principles of the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Now, if you put Section 1 into that context, what does the supremacy of God mean? Doesn't that mean inalienable rights? That the rights that we possess as individuals don't even come from the state in the first instance, they come from the creator. And it's in that context that you must consider this charter. Then what has happened in the lower courts, they've even ignored even mentioning the supreme supremacy of God and the rule of law in one case uh, in so far. And so, and uh, I'm sure you have not heard and a lot of the debates and a lot of the articles that you read very much attention to supremacy of God and the rule of law. But it is the beginning of the charter and comes even before section one. And once again, as a former English teacher, at the end of that sentence, it's not a period, it's a colon. A colon has a meaning, a semicolon has a meaning, a period has a meaning, a comma has a meaning, and they're all different. A colon means what follows. Right? What comes after, right? That's what a colon means. I am going to list the number of animals there is in the world, colon. I am going to tell you uh, who are the uh, National Hockey League players in Canada, colon, right? What follows, what comes after? Well, that's what, this was delivered by us when we wrote that, that sentence, is that all of the other things that come after that sentence have to be considered in the light of supremacy of God in the context of rule of law. This has been missing so far. And so it's my intention and, and many others with me to point this out so that by the time the appeals get to the courts of appeal of the provinces, quite likely three or four provinces for sure, and then on ultimately to the Supreme Court of Canada, that the justices will recognize that what their fellow comrades did in the lower courts was not complete. They did not consider seriously enough section one, nor did they consider seriously enough the preamble to the charter, supremacy of God and the rule of law. So the hockey game isn't over. We're in the latter part of the second period. We've got the full third period to go, and that is the courts of appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada. So I'm not giving up on the courts yet. I know a lot of people have, but I still insist that if Canadians from coast to coast to coast, kept arguing with me that the higher courts now have a solemn responsibility to correct what has happened in the lower courts. They've done it before. It's been done in Supreme Courts all over the world. That's why you have a Supreme Court of Canada, because there may have been a mistake in the lower courts, or otherwise, why have it? If they're all omnipotent at the lower level, well, then why have an appeal court? Why have a Supreme Court of Canada? The mere fact that we do means that there's a possibility that the lower courts got it wrong. And in this case, they got it very much wrong, both in interpreting section one and in interpreting or ignoring the principles of the supremacy of God and the rule of law. So I'm still in there fighting that the courts have an opportunity now to correct what has been done wrong so far. Well, I really appreciate you adding in that uh, mention of the preamble because it's so important and you're right. We don't hear very often the fact that our country, our constitution and our charter is based on the principles of the supremacy of God and the rule of law. I wish our prime minister would com contemplate it. I mean, we have a prime minister, uh, Brian, who routinely breaks the law. I mean, he's had multiple ethics violations. He, he acts oftentimes like he's above the law. He doesn't seem like a person who really does respect the rule of law. I'll, I'll, I'll let you and, jump in because I know you have to say about that. And all the other parties, sadly, that are in the House of Commons are in the same boat. Let me, and, and by the way, he never only broke ethics rules. He broke the law 
he broke the conflict of interest law, which was a law that was passed by the House of Commons, by these very MPs. And he broke it five times, according to the independent conflict of interest ethics commissioner. And Are you nobody talking about the, the Aga Khan, the Aga Khan vacation? Is that what you're referring to? I, I know one. that there's just been a, a okay. That's one, but there oh, are five. Right. right. And you can go into the website of the ethics commissioner and find all five of these. Another one was obstruction of justice. When the minister attorney general, Judy Wilson Rabo, was trying to be forced to change her mind and get her department to change their decision that SNC Lavalin Company had to go to court. They were trying to get a deal outside of court. Then the prime minister was trying to force his minister of justice through his office and through a couple of his ministers and his staff to get the minister who had already made up her mind that this should go to a full court hearing. There was the evidence was quite overwhelming that they had committed wrong and that it should go all the way. The prime minister tried to obstruct the normal course of justice by interfering with attorney general and the minister of justice. If anybody learns anything when they become a leader of a political party, which has the majority of seats in the House of Commons or in a parliament is this. And my first day in office, I was advised by senior people in the government. One thing you must know from the start, Mr. Premier, and I'm sure you've heard of this when you were a minister, that the course of justice, course of justice that is being preceded in your ministry of justice is not to be interfered with by your office or by you. It's one of the principles of British parliamentary democracy. It is a very, very important um, part of this. You, that's untouchable. You don't interfere with what the minister of justice department is bringing forward as various allegations or prosecutions against a person, against a company or whatever. I learned it very early on, 24 hours in, I was advised, you know, you would be well served to leave that alone. That's one, that's sacrosanct. And, and so the prime minister broke those laws. But my bigger point is this, and there's where we have a problem in Canada today. We have no moral compass anymore. And a really good example is that none of the MPs in any of the parties have tried to amend the conflict of interest legislation so that if an MP breaks the law, they cannot serve in parliament. Right now, the prime minister is still serving in parliament, even though he broke the law, because there is no penalties, like a $100 fine, $500 fine for breaking the law, you can still serve in the parliament of Canada. I wrote on my blog a few days ago on this, uh, and I have been in, you know, talking about this for a while. So the, the uh, the problem we have in our nation is the prime minister, but it's also all the other leaders of parties in the House of Commons who have not insisted that this conflict of interest law, we don't need to change the Constitution. All we need is to go to the House of Commons like they do every day when it's open and make a proposal or make a resolution or propose a change to the conflict of interest act. Any party, any MP can, can propose that. And none of the parties have done it. And so therefore they're all guilty by association, by not taking it upon themselves to insist that this, our parliament and our parliamentarians must be honest. And right now they're not. Well, it's so true. Sometimes you just shake your head reading the news and hearing about senators and MPs being charged with crimes and breaking the laws. And it's like, what kind of country is this? Uh, what kind of culture do we have where we don't have the basic respect for the rule of law? We allow politicians to get away with this. I would, I would likewise echo that. I would love to see laws put into place to be stricter against the people who are elected to represent us. I, I wanted to, I wanted to pivot a little bit and ask you about the Emergencies Act because when you were talking about the charter uh, having the uh, demonstrably justifiable. Uh, clause in section one. Um, and, and the idea was that it was during like a wartime or an extreme event. It, it was se seemed very similar to the Emergencies Act. You know, this thing used to be called martial law. It used to be reserved for, you know, the War Measures Act uh, at a time when, when uh, you know, our country was being invaded or there was an insurrection. It seems to me that the prime minister just used it because he didn't like the truckers and he didn't agree with them. Um, I'm wondering if you can, if you can comment on what you saw uh, transpired during the trucker convoy and the government's heavy-handed use of force against those protesters. 
Yes, I was there uh, for a number of days during the when the truckers' convoy situation was at its peak, and I walked the streets of Ottawa, and uh, I didn't see anything that the prime minister and some of his associates saw. They were very civil. Uh, the street the streets were left uh, passable, and the trucks were on the side. And uh, they were negotiating every day with the uh, city of Ottawa to ensure that uh, th this uh, convoy could continue. And meanwhile, people could get, get around. Uh, so, and very few Canadians know that, that the uh, convoy was in touch and negotiating almost every day uh, with the city of Ottawa and the mayor and, and the police of Ottawa. Uh, so what the prime minister and the government did with the support of the NDP and his own M and the Liberal MPs was bringing this extreme measure, which by the way, at the beginning of that piece of legislation, it said must be consistent and conform to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Well, it did not because they never demonstrated at all. And since then, the hearings that have been held have, have shown that there were no outside forces. There's been no um, um, act, um, prosecution brought about anybody about firearms or about violence. The very things that the prime minister used to justify bringing in the emergency act has not materialized when, when it's been looked at. So he did this without the evidence to show, uh, to demonstrably justify that he could override the rights and freedoms of the truckers, okay? He did this without the evidence, the firm evidence to justify what he did. So that was unconstitutional as well very unconstitutional because it violated the charter. Now what, what's happened to show you how much rot we have in our system and very few people talking about it. It was re revealed this morning by a counter signal uh, a news organization that the prime minister appointed yesterday a judge under the act who's supposed to review what happened in the emergency when introducing the emergency measures act, whether it was necessary and so on. But who did he appoint? a judge who was a donor to the Liberal Party. So where is the independence? Where is the transparency? Where is the accountability? If, if the prime minister would, would appoint a judge, surely there's judges around at the higher levels in the provinces who are not contributors to any political party that he could appoint to, to, to show how independent this inquiry is going to be. So this inquiry is tainted right from the start. So we have a government and MPs who are <laughs> violating the charter with their mandates. Then we have a government in Ottawa which is violating the charter by bringing in the Emergency Measures Act. And now we have a prime minister who's appointed a judge to review the bringing in of the Emergency Act, who's a liberal donor to the Liberal Party of which the prime minister is a leader. So that's conflict of interest all over the place. So all of like the Conservative Party of Canada, uh, the NDP Party of Canada, the Green Party, all of the parties that, he, that are now in the House of Commons should be crying blue murder over this. This is ridiculous for a country that calls itself a democracy to have an inquiry about something that the government has done, headed up by a judge that is a party sympathizer. I, I know, I, I agree. And, I, and we saw that earlier when uh, one of the trucker convoy organizers, Tamara Lynch, was also denied bail from a judge who had also been a liberal donor. I just want to point out, because I, I saw that story, the judge, so so the prime minister called a national inquiry into the Emergency Act. When I first saw that news, I thought that was a great story. Okay, great. We're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to figure out why it was called, what happened. And then I sort of read a little bit more. I had to do it. He didn't do it because he was doing something, oh, I, I should call an inquiry to let people know whether, in fact, I did this right or not. He had to do it because it's in the act. Right. Okay. Okay. There you go. But then I, I read the subtext. First of all, the, the judge that was named was Paul Rulu. Now, I spoke to a journalist that refuted that that point and said that the, it was a different Paul Rulu. So I'm not sure that that has been verified that he is a liberal donor or not, but he was certainly a liberal appointee um, who was named the judge that's going to lead this independent public order emergency commission. Um, but I will just say that when you read, read the fine print of what the commission's supposed to be examining, I mean, you can tell right off the bat this thing is going to be incredibly biased. It was they're looking and examining the evolution and goals of the protest, the organizers, the participants, the role of foreign and domestic funding, including crowdsourcing, the use of social 
media and the impact of misinformation and disinformation, which are the popular uh, buzzwords uh, around justifying censorship online, um, the economic and international impact of the blockades, and then the use of force. Well, we know that the international blockades had already been removed by the time the Emergencies Act uh, was brought in. So the whole thing just seems like it's a cooked up exercise in PR on behalf of the, of the Trudeau government. Yeah, listen, uh, the, uh, the, the counter signal produced the documents. They just didn't allege that this judge was a liberal donor. They produced the documents which showed the amount of money that this judge contributed every year from government documents, okay? Because they have to, they have to reveal uh, where their money comes from uh, under law. And his name, that judge's name, appears all through the, the late 1990s and into the year 2000, where he contributed so much each year to the Liberal Party of Canada. These are, these are not the counter signals documents. These are the documents of the government of Canada, right, of, of the law of Canada. And so I think it's pretty clear that this judge was a liberal donor. Number two, it's already been revealed through House of Commons committee meetings that there was no outside interference. FinTech, one of the big organizations around the world which examines the flow of money, has already testified that there was no outside money involved here, that it was all ordinary citizens contributing to a legitimate act of civil disobedience, which is allowed in this country. We're allowed to freely express, we're allowed to freely as assemble. And that's what these people were doing. And so to even put that in the terms of reference shows a complete insult of what has already been testified by fintech and other independent observers and so once again like you say this is a very tainted um, inquiry before it gets off but make no mistake about it the prime minister didn't do anything to demonstrate that he wanted to get to the bottom of this he was forced to do it under law that's why the inquiry is established because there's a provision in the act saying you must establish an inquiry but the other part of all of this is who does it report to? Who does this inquiry report to? Where does the inquiry go? Where does the results of the inquiry? Back to the same MPs who supported the Emergency Act in the beginning. So therefore, it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. It's totally ineffectual because it's in a conflict of interest from day one. Well, the, it's absolutely uh, correct. I'll, I'll take a look at the counter signal report. I hadn't looked closely at it. I will just say that I spoke to a journalist friend and a conservative MP before recording, and they told me that it wasn't the same Paul Relu, but I, I will do some due diligence personally and and, uh, and and get back to you and get back to the audience about, about that. But certainly e either way, it doesn't seem like a, a very healthy uh, exercise in getting to the bottom of something that really truly does deserve, uh, Canadians deserve to know what really happened and the abuses of government need to be highlighted. Well, Brian, I really appreciate your time. I, I had one final question uh, for you and, I, and I, I know we've gone over a little bit, but I do appreciate your time. And I, I wanna just say, you know, looking back at, at 40 years of the charter, uh, do, do you think the charter has lived up to your expectations back then from 1982? Are there any areas where you think that the charter has fallen short? Anything that you wish you had done differently in drafting and putting together the charter? Yeah, man is a fallen being, if you believe in Christianity or some form of spirituality, and none of us are perfect. <clears throat> I think the person who was alleged to be perfect was crucified. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have too, too great a chance here of doing something that's always perfect. So obviously it can always be improved upon any camp. But I would just remind people that this charter, as I said earlier at the opening, was, was not negotiated in and of itself. It was a bargaining chip with other things, Aboriginal rights, uh, uh, re-equalization, uh, amending formula, um, uh, minority language rights, and so on. They were all part of the mix and we were negotiating back and forth. So if you had to do just a charter over again, that's one thing. But anytime you open the Constitution, the parties to the Constitution are going to want other changes and just not to charter change. That's part of living in a, in a, a democracy, right? And, and the participants are going to be looking for various things, including Quebec will be looking for other things because they're not even part of the Constitution right now. <coughs> so <coughs> one has to say, be careful what you wish for, because you might lose the supremacy of God. And, and, and pick up something else on the other end, and whether that's a bargain or not. And so, yeah, you can always do better, but I, I would just say that having those sections 2, 6, 7, and 15 clearly identified 
I mean, how can there be any uh, dispute over life, liberty, and the, and the security of the person? Remember, constitutions are principles. Legislation gets into real detail. But these are principles that then have to be interpreted by the courts. To make them any more definitive, you will lose something or, you, or, or you'll gain something. But remember, it's all compromised. Uh, you, you're, not, you're not into this alone. There are other players and there are other factors at, at, at play. I would just do that. But of course, if you could go back and do anything over again, you can usually make improvements. And we could no doubt in the charter. <clears throat> but remember, you'll never get a situation where you're going to be negotiating the charter by itself. It will always be when you open the charter, you're opening the Constitution. Remember, the charter is in the Constitution Act 1982. It's not the Charter of Rights Constitution Act. It's the Charter, it's the Constitution Act of 1982, of which the Charter is one of seven items. I think it's 30, 60, 60 parts to the Constitution Act, 34 of them are the Charter. All the rest are of the other matters that I've mentioned. So, yes, you can always do better. But in the context of constitution, not legislation, <clears throat> it is far, far more difficult to get exactly what you want from all the players. We all compromise. This is a compromise document, as all of these things are. Well, uh, thank you for, for joining the show and providing so much more context and nuance to the circumstances around the charter, the purpose, some of the more forgotten lines from the charter that we wish uh, were, were more emphasized. And uh, thank you as well for your courage, your advocacy, uh, your voice throughout the last two years. I know you've been a tremendous beacon of hope for so many Canadians who feel discouraged by the overreaches uh, of our government and the state of things. So we, we really appreciate you being out there Brian, uh, on, on the front lines, fighting against government overreach and continuing to do the important work of, of upholding and championing the rights and freedoms of all Canadians. So thank you for that. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it and have a great day. All right. Thank you so much. That is Brian Peckford, the former Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, original signature to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning into that interview. I thought it was great, great conversation with the former Premier of Newfoundland and an original signatory to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I appreciate his time. I wanted to revisit one thing that happened in the interview, though, because you, as you saw, we had a little bit of a dispute over the judge that is presiding over the National Inquiry into the Emergencies Act, the use of the Emergencies Act. Trudeau appointed them. So uh, Peckford, Mr. Peckford made the point that Kean Bexley had reported in the counter signal that this individual was a liberal donor. And now right before I recorded the interview, I had read a message from someone who was refuting that fact. I talked to a journalist and I spoke to a conservative MP. So I just didn't want to put out information that wasn't accurate. I said that I would do a little bit of due diligence and get back to the audience about it. So I'm doing that right now. So what I am referring to is a report that was put out by Brian Lilly. Brian Lilly is a journalist over at the Toronto Sun. And he put this on Twitter. He said, I had a nice chat with Paul Rouleau from Port Colborne, Ontario. He is not a judge and has not been named head of the inquiry. So the claim by many that the judge is a recent donor is false. Okay, then he links to his Toronto Sun piece that he has profiling Paul Rallou, who is the individual who Trudeau named. And let me just read from that report. He says, it fits with Trudeau's style that he waited until the last possible day to call the inquiry and then appointed a former top liberal political staffer to head the inquiry. So Paul Rallou was appointed to the bench by Paul Martin's liberal government in 2002. He isn't simply someone who made a few small donations to the liberal party or someone who went to some cocktail fundraisers. He actually worked for the liberal party in the past, so this is more from Brian Lilly's report. In 1983, he was part of John Turner's leadership campaign to take over when Pierre Trudeau announced his retirement. Rouleau then had a hand in helping pick Turner's cabinet. Once he won leadership, various media reports described him as an executive assistant or an appointment secretary. So we're not just talking about an independent judge here. We're talking about someone who can fairly and accurately be described as a liberal insider, a partisan liberal, a liberal staffer, someone who is a big L liberal, just like Justin Trudeau. Think about it. Justin Trudeau just appointed a party loyalist to head up an inquiry into his use 
of the Emergencies Act. Either way, it's unprecedented whether you take Kean Bexie's word that this guy is a donor or whether you look to Brian Lilly saying, no, he's not a donor, it's not the same guy. However, even worse, this guy was a political staffer for the Liberals. Either way, not good for our country, not good for the state of the rule of law when the person who could be holding Justin Trudeau to account is part of Trudeau's circle, part of the old boys club with the Liberal Party, not a good sign for Canada. Anyway, I wanted to put that out there so that it was clear. I appreciate Mr. Mr. Peckford's time. Thank you so much for tuning into the interview and for following True North.